Okay, are we live? Okay, it looks like we are live. So there you go. We are live. What's going on, guys? Welcome to another video. I am here with a special guest. This is a guy who not only has been showing love, but I saw him do an interview on Strongman's channel. And I got to be honest, this guy is very entertaining. He really has the charisma to have a successful YouTube channel, in my opinion. So I'm like, when he, when he said he wanted to come on, I'm like, yeah, you should definitely come on. Like, this will be a great conversation. <laughs> so welcome in Tay, otherwise known as More Money, who has his own channel. What's up? Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Uh, you know, I was telling you as we were in the uh, in the backstage that your channel is actually one of my favorite channels. It like pops up for me all the time. So I'm just like really um, uh, I'm really happy to have been invited on or or you've been accept accepted me to come on. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So where do you want to start? You want to do you want to do origin stories? How should we do this? You know what? Um, let's start with some juicy details and then we'll go into the origin story. So I it. was telling you that I actually spoke to Seth from uh, formerly of Everything Money. Now, here's the thing. I didn't actually know about the drama that had happened. I just found out one day that he was just no longer on the channel. I thought he mm. might have been busy with like his um, wedding photography or that kind of stuff. Um Cause you know, I just focus on myself. I just focus on like research and stuff. I'm, 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 I'm very deep into that stuff. I don't focus mm -hmm. on a, a lot about like the co coming is goings of like <laughs> YouTube finance. You know what I mean? And so, yep. um, once I found out that, about that, I actually reached out to Seth to see like how he was doing and stuff. And so if you wanted to hear, I have an update from Seth, which I think a lot of the audience would be interested in. Yeah, we would absolutely love to hear. <laughs> yeah, the update so, regarding stuff and what happened. <laughs> so he didn't. There's nothing juicy at all. But you know, I I reached out to him and um, I asked him actually to come on for our live stream. Now he didn't uh, accept, and effectively what he said is that like, um, you know, he's he's um, like uh, his quotes, of course, is my life is much happier essentially now that he's not with the everything money. So the first thing and the most important thing is that um, if anybody cares about some of the creators, um, especially when they go through some drama. Um, mm. If you were concerned about like how he's doing, he's doing fine. He, he said that he's a lot happier. And, um, you know, he did say that he's been forced to move on with his life. And he actually started managing another company. And so he wow. has done well. And so that's, you know, it made me happy to hear that. So I figured that there might be some people out there who might be happy to hear that as well. Um, and yeah, ultimately... Just a really kind back and forth. That was largely it. Um, but our man's doing well. And like I hope one day he does come back to uh, YouTube Finance in some way, shape, or form. Uh, either doing um, uh, live chat, live streams, or, or whatever it is. Because there's a lot of people who only tuned in to Everything Money because of him. You know, there's a lot of yeah, people, me, right. me included. And yeah. so... Um, I don't think he realizes how much love he has in the community. I don't think I've ever heard anyone say anything bad about him, you know, which is interesting because I've heard that about the other guys, but not necessarily him, you know? And so, um, yeah, I hope he does come back one day. Yeah, for sure. And you said something very interesting, I guess, when Seth was talking to you, he basically said he's much happier now. And that gives us, in my opinion, a little bit of insight into like how it is working for Paul, which we all suspect is probably miserable. So to me, the fact that he said he's much happier to me is like very telling on probably what kind of boss uh, Paul and well, I guess Paul, because he's the boss uh, was. Yeah. Yeah. Now, interesting thing about him. I don't know if you heard recently, he called himself the LeBron James of investing or like finance investing YouTube. Uh, did you did you hear that comment? Not only did I hear it, I made a video on it. <laughs> oh, sorry. I'm I'm just Oh no, you're good. It. Yeah, oh yeah. I made a video on that one. I got him good. That that's oh, just clown God. behavior. <laughs> like the way I think about that is you, you know what I thought as soon as I, I heard that? I, I thought like if I were to talk to any one of my friends who are like for real value investors, they manage, you know, billion dollar funds or any any of those types of people, what would they consider themselves? And um you know, the answer is from any conversations that I've ever had with anybody who does this for a living, um, their conversation always is, hey, I really like it, but I just hope to not make a mistake. That's really what I get out of these people. Yeah. They're very humble. Like value investors are just humble in general because, you know, part of it is most of what you're trying to do is just not make a mistake, right? That's really most of what just you're trying to do. Not freaking get wrecked. Yeah. And so it's like, to have that kind of ego where you're saying, yo, I'm the LeBron James of value investing. It's like, dude, you're a guy with a camera in Ohio. Chill. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. And you say you're LeBron James of investing, but there's no verifiable proof. Most of these big investors, we can see like their returns and how they've done. We can see how Kathy Wood's doing, her holdings. We still have no idea how Paul is doing if he's beating the market. So it's just insane for you to call yourself the LeBron James of investing when nobody in the investing committee knows who you are. You're Like yeah. you said, you're, he's a guy with a camera. Like, as far as I'm concerned, I know these guys are finance YouTubers, but in my opinion, none of these guys are real investors. They're actually just YouTubers. Like, they have no respect in the finance community. CNBC doesn't know who they are. Nobody of any importance in finance knows who they are. You're just a guy with a camera who got a bunch of retail investors to believe in you. I don't know. That's and really yeah, all and it there's is. There's nothing. there's nothing wrong with that either. The only... Mm -hmm issue that i would have is um if you're gonna get like i think they give out action alerts right like they give out stock alerts uh with like their trading platform mm -hmm. i think i correct me if i'm wrong there but if you're giving trading alerts like buys and sells during the day i feel like at that point you have to disclose your positions and stuff that's what i think I too yeah know. So, so um, that way you can avoid, and just for legal reasons, you could avoid what happened to the Atlas Trading Group, right? Now, tell me what happened there. I'm, I'm not up to date there. Sure. So, so basically, it's exactly like what you're saying. If you're giving buy and sell alerts or telling people, I think the stock is going to go to ten dollars, then people should know what your position is in that stock. Yeah. And so, what these Atlas Trading dudes did, which is, you know, the guy Mr. Zach Morris and PJ Matlow, they all have like half a million followers on Twitter. It's insane. What they would do is. They would all coordinate together and use their big followings, and they would all buy a stock at the same time, a very small, low float penny stock. And pump then after and that, pump. they yeah, they would pump it on their chat on their Twitters and be like, This stock's going to 10. This is our next big play. It's gonna do this, post some BS research. And then, like two, three hours after they make their post and the stock runs up, they would sell. Literally, even yeah. though they're telling their followers. I'm still long. I'm here with you guys. Blah, blah, blah. That whole thing. It was insane. Oh, you know what? I actually read about that in the Wall Street Journal. I just didn't put the names together. But as soon as he said Zach Morris, I remembered. Yep. Because for any of you guys that are old like me, you would remember the name Zach Morris from a Saturday morning TV show called Saved by the Bell. <laughs> the main <laughs> character. So yep. that's how I put two and two together. But yeah, you know what? Those guys... If they're trying to hide behind that, you know how everyone does it. I do it too on my in the beginning of my videos. Like this is not investment advice. You shouldn't take anything that I say as like um, an endorsement for securities, or whatever. Mm -hmm. If they're trying to hide behind that in social media, I think they get. I think they get screwed here. I think the. Um, I think the SEC still comes after that, and it sounds like that's what's happening. Like the they're gonna get sued, fined, and potentially even face jail time. That's sounds like what's happening here. Yeah, for sure. They're facing like 20, 30 years in prison. I think Zach Morris is facing like way more. Am I muted? Wait a minute. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I've heard you the whole time. Oh, okay. Sorry. I thought I was muted. Yeah. So that that's kind of what's going on there. And uh, there were some crypto lawyers. I made a video talking about this too. There were some crypto lawyers who actually came out and spoke about like the whole not financial advice disclaimer. And they said that doesn't protect you from the law at all. Like, yeah. like that doesn't mean anything. They they really just said like that doesn't do anything. Like you can't just say this is a financial advice and then give financial advice or break the law and think that that's going to save you. And, and that's what makes me speculate that the SEC is going to start going after these YouTubers, too, because I have no doubt that there are some YouTubers out there who did the exact same thing that the Atlas people did. Yeah, well, one name that came to my mind was that Chris Sane guy. And like as I pivot mm -hmm. into that, the point I wanted to make there was early in 2020 when everything started raging upwards, um, I had two, a, a, a big part of my like professional contacts are just like CPAs and stuff. Cause I happen to be a CPA. So I just know um, quite a few people who, who are CPAs as well, who went through the big four with me. And I had two separate people reach out to me and they gave me two names. They said, you need to start a YouTube channel. And these are the two guys you need to be like. The first name was Chris Sane. The second name was Meet Kevin. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, okay. I, I didn't hear, I didn't know about either one of them. At, well, I kind of knew about Meet Kevin. I didn't know about Chris Sane. So I looked up both their channels. I'm like, this is going to get these guys in trouble. Because not only are they pumping stocks, but they're pumping stocks that uh, some of these companies have zero income. Um, there's no valuation model. Uh, I think Meet Kevin actually came out with a model for Tesla, which was, 
like you would have to assume that they automate taxi driving uh, to meet that valuation. Like it was so high. <laughs> and um, I just find it funny that smart people were following these guys. And, uh, yeah. uh, but I guess, you know, starting just with Chris, Chris Zane, um, I don't know if you know this, I was looking at his channel cause I, I haven't watched it in like a year. And then I went back and watched it and I actually went on what's called social blade. So that's just like oh. your knowledge or terms for YouTubers. Social blade is just a way for you to, uh, check the health of your channel and other competitor channels and stuff. Do you know that he has no new subscribers since at least December, 2021 as per social blade? <laughs> <laughs> I know his views of tank, but I, I didn't know he lost. I didn't know he hasn't gained a single subscriber the entire year. That's pretty insane. I mean, unless they got it wrong, but they get my stuff pretty right. So I'm assuming that they're pretty right. Um, now with respect to that comment about views, um, my channel's got less than 10,000 subs in the last three months. I averaged 70,000 views his channel. I can't remember. Somebody let us know in the comments exactly what Chris Sane's subscriber count is, but I'm assuming it's over 700. So almost like eight times my channel, I would say nine times my channel mm -hmm. in the last three months, he's got 400,000 views. So my little channel, that's not even crossed 10,000 has a quarter of his views now. So that sh shows you what's happening to all these guys that were pumping and dumping garbage, you know? Yeah, I, I can Allegedly. speak. Yeah, no, I can speak more to that. Well, one, I'll say this. Social Blade, I'd be careful with. Um, I, I didn't even know what that was until that Scott Schaefer clown tried to justify it and say that I bought bots and all that crap. But that's a different story. Uh, I know Social Blade is like this third party app, I guess. But uh, even going beyond the Social Blade thing, because, you know, we don't even know if that's fully accurate. But just if you look at all of these guys, like besides me, Kevin, if you just look at Chris Sane, Stockmo, Larry Jones, Keenan Grace, their views have just plummeted. It is yeah. insane. And even some of these crypto YouTubers, like I, I saw some of these crypto YouTubers were getting 100K views per video back during the bull market. And now these guys can't even get 2K views on a video. It's, it is insane uh, <laughs> how much these guys' channels have plummeted, which gives me hope. It tells me that I think people kind of have woken up and kind of realized, yeah, this guy's kind of an idiot. And my thoughts on that are, mm -hmm. I think the people just went away. I, I think they just disappeared. Um, and I think it'll come back. I, I I know some people in the space are a little bit optimistic that the space will like clear itself out, but that would assume that the viewers are rational. And I think um, some of these smaller channels that are very value investing focused. The majority of your viewers are rational. And I'll give you an example. Um, but I think some of the people that were following these like pumpers, you know, the cryptos, the meme stocks, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Those people will be back whenever there's another rush. And uh, just the example of, I think, a viewership base that was a little bit more intelligent, a little bit um, uh, more um, uh, uh, like understands what's going on. I just can't remember the name. I think it was Spencer Cornelia. Um, <laughs> yeah. And I know you've done videos on him, but that was one where I was a fan of his channel, you know, and, um, I never called out any YouTubers. I didn't, I don't like to play in, in that area. Not that it's playing, but like, mm -hmm. I, I just focus on what I'm doing. But when I saw him put out a video defending his buddies, I was just thinking, how is anybody going to, um, take him seriously anymore? Because his whole brand was calling out people who are bad actors in the space. Right. Yep. And so is he now just going to call out bad actors that are not his friends? Like what's the, what's the deal there? And so, I think he lost a lot of credibility. And then you pointed it out um, in your, on your channel. I saw the video where like his views are just Dying. vomiting downward, yep. just dead. Dying. And it is fantastic to see. <laughs> yeah. Stuff like that gives me hope. Yeah. He, um he defended his friends. That's the last video he had that had six figure views. That, that video got 200 K views. And then every other video since then, he can't even get, 100k views anymore it's it, it's crazy and what i pointed out to people is the way youtube works is people are just lazy so what they'll do is they won't unsubscribe they'll just not watch your video that's and right then what happens is you get less views on your video at least spencer in this case and because he's getting less views from his own core audience who still subscribe 
YouTube reads that as this is a bad video. So YouTube doesn't push out that video as much. That's so his right. videos aren't getting recommended that much on the algorithm because his own audience who still follows him and won't unsubscribe, just won't watch the videos or just don't care anymore. So it's like, yeah, that guy really shot himself in the foot. It is, it is hilarious. It is well, crazy. I mean, if you're going to be, I call it like, if you're going to try to be Danny Tanner, that, that might be an old reference to people. It's like full house. Well, there is a difference between the character that was played on the show, full house, mm -hmm. Danny Tanner and the person, Bob Saget. And if you ever, this might just be an inside comedy. So I don't know if you know, but I was a stand-up comic for a few years now. Um, nice. If you ever um, went and saw a Bob Saget show, he's very crude. He's very, he, he swears a lot. He's absolutely not the person that you think Danny Tanner is. And so if you're into like good, mild hearted humor, no swearing, blah, blah, blah. And you went to a, um, and you went to a Bob Saget show, you'd be turned away. You know what I mean? And, uh, yeah. um, there's an expectations gap there. And I, I think, uh, uh, with Spencer, the expectation was that he was going to be similar to like what coffee Zilla is, but it, uh, uh, he ended up shooting himself in the foot. Uh, and you know, I'm interested to see what happens to him down the road. I know like just being on YouTube from like the early days, YouTube can be forgiving, but there are situations where the people have never been forgiving to channels. And you pointed one out where it had 2 million subscribers, but just no views at all. And I never even oh, heard about that yeah. channel. London Real. Oh yeah, that guy really <laughs> screwed himself over. Yeah. But but London Real, London Real was different from Spencer. I'll, I'll be honest here. London Real messed up like a million times. Like he just kept doing stuff that just pissed off fans. Like he, he yeah. kept doing stuff. So Spencer's got, I'd say two, Spencer's got two under his belt. So he's got the established title scam. And then he has, uh, you know, obviously him helping. Actually, no, Spencer has more. He has him helping his friends. He has the fact that he called out a fake guru sports, not sports gambler, a fake guru casino gambler named Mickey. And then he became like friends with him and friends like started him, yeah. hanging out with him and stuff. And then he has like one fourth thing. So yeah, he's, he's, yeah, he's, he's striking out here. It's crazy. And Homer's got it. He said uh, Chris Sane has 470,000 subs and gets 5 to 10K views per video, which is nuts. So that's another channel that I think will inevitably end up dying. And, um, you know, I wanted to point that out because I'm going to send this live stream to the two people that recommended those two channels to me and just say, like, um, you guys should have known better. You guys have um, Ivy League undergrad educations and you have either cpas or cfas and you still fell for this crap like uh and what it tells you is that um intelligence doesn't necessarily matter as much as people think in investing it's your emotions as well are you trying to get rich quick or are you mm -hmm. trying to um build long-term sustainable wealth and i think a lot of people got caught up especially in 2020 when they saw sort of like that um, what's his name? Not Hello Kitty, but uh, that um, cat guy, I forgot his name, who invested in GameStop. Chris, Keith Gill, that was his name. Oh, and yeah. they saw him make like 27 million. And I think everybody got caught up in that. Or a lot of even smart people yeah. got caught up in that, you know. Roaring yeah, Kitty. Ha Hashi with the answers, man. This guy's crushing it. Someone give him a prize. Roaring Kitty. Roaring yeah, Kitty. There it. it is. You know, it's got actually it. funny. On, on my channel, I have people drop meows in the chat. And that originally started with <laughs> Roaring Kitty. So really? if, you're, if you ever read the comments of my channel, you'll see a bunch of people just dropping meows all the time. <laughs> nice. Nice. Now, do you have any questions for me? What do you got for me? Oh, yeah. I got plenty. Uh, but I did, I did want to go back keep on because i have something yes. i have to say about like the chris saying and everything like that yeah, yeah go what's for it. also interesting and this is something that i learned about youtube because a lot of people will comment under my video well not a lot but some people will comment on my videos or just text me individually why don't you ever talk about stocks anymore why don't you ever analyze or anything like that and i'm like in my personal opinion the way youtube works is you have to make not only good content but you have to make content that people want to watch yeah and there's two things that i learned one chris saying and stock mowing all them, whatever, they don't make good content. So part of the reason why their channels are dying uh, is because their content just downright sucks. It's just some yeah. boring dude talking. Like, it's just, it's just there's no entertain. Like, these guys aren't char char charismatic at all. Like, it's 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 crazy. And then, and then the other part is, to it, in, in my personal opinion, uh, nobody really comes to YouTube for real value. So it's funny when 
people criticize me and say, you provide no value. You just do drama. But it's like, no, nobody comes to, to YouTube for that. Like I've seen you, I mean, for crying out loud, everything money, their highest viewed videos is them talking about other YouTubers, their highest viewed yeah. videos. Tom Nash had a video going over DCF, like literally breaking down. And obviously I'm not saying he's the best person for it, but still he did it. He broke down how to do a discounted cash flow model. That video performed terribly. So it's just funny when people say that. And I'm like, you guys are full of it because YouTube knows you better than you know yourselves. And at the end of the day, you, you don't want that. You just don't like, it's boring. It's just, you all want the fast money. Like it's crazy. Yeah. So yeah. part of the blame goes on like the people too, in my opinion, for sure. Some of it. Yeah. And I mean, it's okay. Uh, you just have to make a decision as a creator. And, and you made a comment on one of your live streams uh, when I was just like messaging on the live stream. Uh, I think it was right before you went on your trip. And mm -hmm. um, the comment was to me, it was like, you're surprised that my channel's not bigger. And I think the reason why that is, is because you have to make a decision. Do you want to be a big YouTuber in the mm -hmm. finance space at least? Or do you want to be a valuable YouTuber? If you're going to be a valuable YouTuber, then you're just going to be small and you have to be okay with it. And so I decided to double down on being a valuable YouTuber and not being a big YouTuber. And so I stopped caring about subscribers, subscriber growth and, uh, growth and stuff. And I started caring more about the relationships with the people that I do have who continue to come back. And so on every single one of my videos, you'll see the same people comment. You got Mike in there. You got Rob in there. You got JF in there. Like these people have actually become my friends and like, yeah, I only get a thousand views per video or whatever, but that's all I care about. Cause like YouTube isn't where I make my money, right? YouTube will never be more than like right now it's less than a percentage of my annual income. And I hope if I'm successful as an investor, YouTube will always remain less than a percent, you know? Yeah. And so, yeah. And, and, and the other part you touched on too, is how, um, YouTube's not your full-time income either. So you're content with providing value regardless of whatever the stats show, because it's like, you're not trying to be like this gigantic YouTuber with millions of dollars. You already have your career and you're happy with it. Yeah. And I think that's good. I think those types of people are more trustworthy over people who are full-time YouTubers and depend on it for their income. Cause now they're more inclined to take those scummy sponsorships or do whatever they can to get clicks on their channel. And I don't have a problem with that if you're doing something else like pranks or something, but when you're in the finance space, that's where it starts to get dicey because there's just so there's so much buffoonery in the finance space. It is insane. And I love the comment about how, oh, because some institutional investors fell for this like Bitcoin stuff, that means that we're off the hook because if these smart people um, can fall for it, then we're exonerated in some way or shape or form. Well, you said two things there without saying it. The first thing and this is from that Spencer video, right? The first thing you said is that one, we probably shouldn't be listening to you because you're not smart enough to um, uh, 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 identify these sorts of like risks. I'm not even saying identify scams, but identify risks. Um, and so we probably shouldn't be listening to you guys anyways, you and all your friends. And then the second thing is just because somebody else drinks the Kool-Aid doesn't necessarily mean that you didn't drink the Kool-Aid, right? Because there was... A lot of investors, and you know, I, I hate to talk about myself here, but when I was looking into Bitcoin, it was early 2021. I asked every single Bitcoin guru that I could ask, and I didn't I didn't shade them on the channel or anything, but I just said, How do you value Bitcoin? Every single one of them did not provide me with a reasonable answer. And so I determined that you cannot value Bitcoin. And then I went ahead and valued Bitcoin anyways. And the closest to valuing Bitcoin I got was it was a um, speculative asset that takes a percentage of what you would have deployed into other speculative assets that have a little bit more use like uh, like a gold. So if you were um, if you were to take the market cap of gold and mm -hmm. say, hey, you know, if people uh, people who deploy funds to gold, if they take 95 percent of what they would deploy to gold and put it into gold and then five percent into Bitcoin. That's what the market value for the all, totality of Bitcoin should be. And that's the best type of valuation I could get. But I never heard a single finance YouTuber even try, you know, not even once. And so, um, and they were investing in it, right? How can yeah. you invest in something if you don't know what the value is? And so that blew me away. Yeah. But a lot of these, a lot of these guys too, 
don't know how to how to value anything. They it, honestly, most of these people are just glorified gamblers. So when you look at it, it kind of makes sense. I mean, for crying out loud, I literally was texting me Kevin like two days ago when I was doing a video, and I talked to him about. He was talking to me about how Tesla, like he's had a really bad year, and Tesla's done so bad he didn't expect it. And let me see if I can find what he said because you're gonna get a kick out of this. It's funny what he <laughs> said, and it really just made me say, "All right, bro, I, I can't win with you." Okay, while you find that, I'll answer one of these questions. So sure, Gil sure. asked, what are your thoughts on me, Kevin, buying the jet? And like you already got uh, Echo's thoughts on that. My thoughts are it's not a tax write-off. And the reason why, so a, a lot of you guys don't know this. Um, I actually have a tax, a very small corporate tax company that I operate. Uh -huh. um, I do not advertise it because I'm trying to get rid of my clients. So um, I raise their bill every year so that they'll leave me, but they don't leave me. They just keep coming back. But um, the thing, the the what you got to understand about jets is that any capital item, you're only gonna get a tax write off from the uh, from the um, amount of the capital cost of the asset. So call it ten million dollars times your tax rate, and so you're still gonna have a net payout of cash. So you're not actually saving anything. So when people think of tax write-offs, it's not actually like you're getting this thing for free. You're still paying money. You're just paying a little bit less. That's the first thing. The second thing is hangar fees, operating fees, maintenance fees, pilot fees, fuel costs, all that. You're not saving any money. So to suggest that you're doing it from any fin from any sort of like financial perspective doesn't make sense. Sorry, go ahead with your uh, Tesla comment. Oh, no, you're good. We could talk about that later. This is more important. This is great because you have real experience in this. So, you know. So my question would be because when Kevin texted me, he said he would say he said he's going to save about five to six million dollars by doing this. And you're saying probably not. Well, I'm going to say that the way he might say five or six million dollars is previously he might have been using a. um a subscription service to having access to private jets, like a net jets or something. Mm -hmm. So it, it might be like a lease versus own decision for him. So I don't want to say that he may not necessarily be saving cash. That might be how he's saving cash where he's flying so much that it just might make sense for him to own. But uh, I just want to clear up the misconception where people say, where, where people think when somebody says, Hey, this is a tax write-off that it means that he's getting it for free. He's not getting it for free. He's still paying money for this. Plus, um, I think just the annual operating costs will sort of offset any material tax write-off that he would get. But you really have to understand his tax situation, which I don't. So I'm right. purely speculating as well, right? Right. So do you think overall this is a bad decision by him overall? It is. So I, you're going to hate my answer here. and yeah. And the reason why is because um, I think I try to look at it from both perspectives. So, um, it could be a bad decision from the perspective of, I don't think he's popular enough to get noticed in an airport, especially with a mask on. So like, if you're look, like a lot of people, like a lot of my friends who have private jets, uh, I don't really, uh, let me call them acquaintances and all of my friends. Um, they do it because either it's time, they just need to get places very in like a time sensitive for, format mm -hmm. or uh it's they get noticed at at um, airports i don't think he's popular enough to get noticed i mean he might but with yeah. a mask on maybe not but the second thing is um you know the time perspective he might want to save time so from that perspective sometimes time is money um so it might be a good investment from that perspective from a cost perspective it might also be a good investment because if he's using a subscription service and now he goes to a capital cost model that might be a good um rationale as well where i think it could be a bad decision is if he's not getting at least that time saving so like if he's not finding ways to generate more income as a result of that time savings then of course um what is he really investing in mm. so it's a terrible answer but i'm just trying to be fair no it no it's a great answer you're, you're giving a different perspective and we appreciate that so then my my next thing will be can he really afford it? Because I would argue no, because again, when I talked to him, he said he had to sell Tesla stock uh, in order to, to pay the down payment. And we all know your stocks are long-term. That's your long-term money. You're not supposed to sell your stocks yeah. to make big purchases. If you don't have the money in your account, then you can't afford it. That's the way I look at it. Unless you got some type of passive income or something coming in. But 
overall, it, it doesn't look like he could afford it, given the fact that he had to sell Tesla stock at a huge loss to come up with the money. Yeah, and the only way I can talk about that is from my own experience. Now, I bought my dream car maybe like five years ago. Now, I don't talk about what cars I own or mm -hmm. houses I live in or whatever, but it's actually funny. Um, this will make me sound like a bit of a douche, but like I remember someone, one of these YouTubers doing like a house walkthrough and it was like, he was pretending like it was like this very expensive house and like relatively it was expensive, like 800 grand house or something. And I'm just like, okay. yeah. if you think that that's an expensive house, man, like God, you know, but I'll just pause there. I don't want to come off like more of like a douchebag, but like uh, the point I'm making is like, you don't have to talk about how much money you have, what you drive, all that stuff to come off as intelligent and, and, and for people to recognize whether or not whether or not you know how to deploy capital game knows game game sees game you know see what i'm saying yeah. um but sorry back to your question um when it came down to buying that car i actually bought two of them i bought one for myself and one for uh the the my wife and um what i ended up doing was i just had um excess cash in the portfolio because i had um some cash secured puts that came off and um, I couldn't imagine selling long-term stocks to even pay for the down payment. It's just not how I work, but oftentimes I'm investing in things that are very like hated. And so I never catch the bottom. So I'll buy something and then it'll just keep going down. If anybody has been on my channel and saw me talk about Alibaba, you just saw that continue to go down. So like, I'm definitely not selling these things at a loss to, to pay for a depreciable asset. That's for sure. So there's my answer. I don't think it's sound, like something sounds fishy, right? Something sounds fishy. And if you have that kind of money, if you've got jet money, um, I don't know if you need to be selling stocks to make a down payment on the jet. I don't know what percentage the down payment would be. I would assume because it's a depreciable asset, most oh, uh, lenders would require 20%. So you're talking 20% of a 10, $15 million asset. That's a lot of money that you're- uh, You good. I got it right here. It's 25% down on 12.8 million. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Because in terms of underwriting, um, any kind of depreciable assets like that, you're gonna you're gonna require twenty percent or more. Uh, I don't know what the amortization terms are on jets. I'm assuming those amortization terms are like ten years. Uh, on RVs, you can get away with twenty years, but um, so it also has a. So here's why I bring that up. Because if the amortization term is five years, um, then the cash component, like the the principal component to service that debt is extraordinary every year. And so you need to have an extraordinary amount of cash coming in every way just to service the principal, let alone the interest. We're in a higher interest rate environment as well. Mm -hmm. So um, you have um, a liquidity challenge. And if you need to sell stocks to um, come up with 25%, then it tells me that there are some indications that you could have a liquidity challenge, but I don't want to speak on his behalf because I don't have access to his financials, but it seems a little bit weird to me. Like I've, you know, servicing, um, servicing any debt, whether it be mortgage or car payments or student loans back when I had them or anything, I've never had to sell securities, but I'm also very cheap. And so, um, I don't buy jets. <laughs> Okay, here's the here's the last question I got uh, regarding that jet, or I guess a statement. So I don't know if you know this, but he actually tried to buy a jet last year. Uh, this one was more expensive. It was a $25 million jet. And what happened was he tried to buy it. He went through everything and ended up getting to the point where he just, I guess, didn't have the money for it. So he already put the down payment and everything, and something basically happened. I know Scott Schaefer did a video on it, but I think Kevin spoke on it himself. And basically the deal just fell through. It didn't work out. Now, did when he spoke about it, did he say why the deal fell through? Like, was it a result of not having enough principal or was there something else wrong with the deal? It definitely was. I don't remember him saying something else wrong with the deal, but I, I remember him. Uh, he addressed it. I just don't remember what he said because that was so long ago. That was like that was like November of 2021 okay. where he like briefly talked about it, but I, I'd have and to find it. And once again, I know you're going to hate me for doing this, but I always try. No, to no, no, no. Time. I don't hate you at all. No, I <laughs> love the fairness, man. We're good. I love that you're not biased. You just give your honest opinion. That's dope. Yeah. Oh, and, yeah. yeah. Go, go for okay, it. Okay. So when we were buying this house, mm -hmm. um, and it, uh, you know, when we were doing the financing, I laid out my, um, I laid out exactly what I wanted from the lenders. 
And I used a broker just so that they can talk to multiple lenders because what I ask for is very uh, specific. And, um, you know, I'll put down your 20, 30, 40, 50, whatever you need down, but the loan terms, the interest rates, amortizations, like I need exactly what I need. And my lender in the last minute asked for something else. And I won't go into the disclosure about it, but I said to that lender that this is a big deal for you guys, but I'm willing to walk away from this deal if you don't hold to your original terms. And um, I remember my wife at the time was like, you're nuts. But sometimes you got to play hardball with banks because they will play hardball with you and they're used to getting their way. And so the only thing that I would say um, that could defend him is that the bank tried to play hardball with him last minute. Now I've purchased homes before and I know he's a real estate guy. So he's done this as well. When it comes to um, buying real estate to invest. So like maybe 10 years ago, I used to buy homes and I would like turn them into duplexes and rent them out and stuff. Um, The banks would play hardball with me in those situations. I'm like, Hey, listen, I'm ready to walk away from this. I don't care, but I know that this is going to look worse on you if I walk away from this. So stick to your original deal. And so that something like that might've happened with him. He does come from that world where he's, um, where, where there's like that sort of mentality where you're, you will walk away from these deals. So something like that could have happened or the alternative is probably what everybody's thinking where the uh, down payment, like the amount that he, he need to come up with couldn't come up with and it could have been a blend of that right because the bank could have come back come back and said look you said you wanted to put 20 but you know what um the market's declining we want 40 you know and so yeah okay no that's a fair one and so in our in our conversation of talking about everything uh you definitely seem to be well accomplished so let's go ahead and get into your uh your background and like kind of how you started and how you got to where you are now okay so um You know, there's a lot of younger viewers, but back in like 1997 through around 2000, 2001, there was the uh, dot-com bubble. And that's kind of when I learned about securities investing in in, in general. And um, I wasn't really invested at the time, but I was just trying to learn as much as I could. And so what I decided to do at that point was my whole future was going to be dedicated to learning about investing. And uh, I became even more interested in it when the stock market blew up. So a lot of people, I'll I'll just give you guys a name that you might remember or that you would know, Amazon. So Amazon was even popular back then. And that stock came down as well. And I might be misremembering guys, correct me in the comments if I'm misremembering, but I'm pretty sure I remember in 2002, Amazon was, the stock had crashed, but it's still trading at 100 times earnings. But the point I'm making is, um, everything that I did subsequent to that was, at 15, I knew what I wanted to do. So I was very lucky, you know, from that perspective. And um, so uh, I won the business award in high school because I took only business classes. I went into finance. I double majored in finance and accounting. I got my CPA. Um, I went and worked for a big four accounting firm. Uh, after that, I became a, uh, an assistant controller. From there, real, I went Real quick, to, real quick. Which yeah. one? Was it Deloitte or PwC? Oh, or KPMG. KPMG. Oh, KPMG. Nice. Okay. Yeah. All right. Keep yeah. going. I, I, I actually um, briefly also worked for PwC, but okay. um, that, was, that was a short stint. And uh, I went into, um, I, I, I took, uh, basically, you, sometimes you'll get like multiple job offers. You know what I mean? And so yeah. that's what happened there. Yes. Um, I, uh, from from KPMG, you know, I, I worked as an assistant controller because I felt like understanding how to build financial statements was very important. I became sort of like a cash flow expert working in on on the financial reporting side. Uh, but it was also boring and I never really wanted to be there, but I felt like it was important for my development that I was there. I was supposed to go right into equity research. Then after that, I went into equity research, did a few years there. And now I'm in what you would call corporate finance. So there are people that are backwards looking at companies. And those are your typical CPAs, your, your accountants, your controllers, your directors of finance, et cetera. Then there's people that are forward looking finance. The, more most common role would be a CFO. Everything under that is just kind of like a junior CFO. So I'd call myself like a, uh, well, I guess I'm, I'm at the senior director or vice president level of finance. And so I own the financial statement modeling. So I'm, I show you guys models on the channel, but the models that I build out for work are like thousand line models and, and they have multiple sheets that roll into the modeling. And so I need to know all the nitty gritties, understand all the products, everything. I talked to Wall Street, so I have that investor relations component. Um, 
Um, I collaborate with all of the senior management. In fact, I owe <laughs> a vice president something right now, which I'll do after this call. What's up, strong man? And <laughs> um, man in the building. <laughs> so yeah, a little bit boring, but um, essentially, what I do for the channel, I do for companies, and uh, I've taken two companies public. Uh, but I'm just in the background, like the CFO and the CEO will get all the credit, but the guy putting together everything, all the decks, the models, even like the Q and A's. Um, so like when they go on, um, quarterly conference calls, it's my job to identify what questions the street is going to ask and make sure that they have an answer. And so I'll, I'll put sheets in front of them of like potential questions. I'll brief them on the questions that they would have gotten from the, uh, uh, like I'll brief them on questions that are competitors might have gotten etc and so um that runs into a second problem with my channel is that it probably will eventually go away because i'm about one step away from that cfo level and so uh the channel might have to go away eventually and so we'll see what happens there. Hey, you're gonna be busy but that yeah. but that's an exciting incredible step you know that's amazing yeah i'm not there yet yeah. I, I don't yeah. think i'm smart enough but hopefully you know, if I can even be 5% of what the people that I report to are, uh, I'll be very happy, <laughs> you know? For sure. For sure. Nice. So I guess my next question will be, how do you feel? Because, you know, a lot of people do the whole get rich quick thing, but yeah. as somebody who's well accomplished, I guess, what would you tell the average investor? What is the best thing you would recommend on people who say, I want to be rich or I want to be wealthy or I want to do what you did. I want to buy my dream car or whatever. What, what's yeah, your advice yeah. to that type of person who wants this, that, say, that same thing? Well, you know, the advice is going to be silly, but um, I'm going to actually, at the end of this call, and we'll, we'll tag it onto this video, is, uh, send you um, uh, a picture. And excuse me, I think it's the most important graph for finance. And I built this out for... Uh, people two years ago. And I don't think I've ever shared it on my channel, but essentially what it does is it numerically proves that the most important thing that you can do in the first 10 years of investing is just focus on how much you're saving. And that will increase the rate of uh, your portfolio growth higher than if you were to get you know, higher rates of return. And let's be reasonable what higher rates of returns are. You're not going to get 100% a year compounded. Um, irrespective of what uh, Lefufu's uh, community will tell you. Um, I just had to say that because strong man's here. Um, and um, yeah, like you're just not going to get high, high rates of return. And so even if you were to get 15% a year, which is somewhat, it's still out of the realms of what you should expect, especially as a new investor, but you could, even with that rate of return, you're still probably going to do better just focusing on how much you save. So number one, and the number one thing I do, and I still do to this day, is I focus on the amount invested. And so I was talking to my wife, uh, because we're getting to the end of the year, we have a budget model. So I would say one, create a budget model. Um, we pay ourselves first, which is we, out of every paycheck that comes in, um, the first thing that happens is I move money into the portfolio. So that's the first thing I do before I pay any bills. Um, and we focus on what percentage of our portfolio we can save. And I think we are close to, I mean, we had some expenditures this year, but I think we're still close to around 80 or 90%. Don't quote me, maybe 80% of everything that has come into the house mm -hmm. has gone out in, in into the portfolio. And, you know, that takes time. I'm at a higher level. But when I first started my very first year, I made 45K that year um, and I saved 10K. I lived at home with my mom. I stayed at home as long as I could um, just so I can save up uh, as much so when as did I you could. move out? When did you move uh, out? I moved out when I was 27. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's not yeah. So, uh, I, yeah, I just, I did the math and I, I could afford a, a home and, you know, the mortgage was only around 1500 bucks. Now, the advice I'd give to a lot of people who are in large city centers is, um, really focus not just on how much you earn from the job, but also focus on uh, what the cost of living in that location will be. I get a ton of offers to go work in Manhattan, a ton. And uh, I won't do it. I, I also won't work downtown Toronto um, because the cost of living would just be so much higher, right? The first thing I did when the pandemic started is um, I sat down with my wife and I said, look, we're going to take a position here where I don't think work from home or work from the office is ever um, a <laughs> strong man's moving home yeah, with the babies. <laughs> but, uh, oh, by the way, strong man, my baby's finally here. It's one, he's one week old now, 
Oh, but nice. anyways, congrats, bro. I didn't even thank know that. You. Congrats. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, I kept I filmed videos for the channel just so that the channel kept going, but I haven't done mm -hmm. anything on the channel for like a week now. But yeah. um, anyways, back to the point before I bore you with this answer, but um um uh I would uh, I took a position that working from home would never go away. And so we actually moved two hours outside of Toronto. Um, and we did sort of like an arbitrage, you know, get rid of one house and purchase another one that's much smaller. Uh, or, sorry, less expensive because Toronto homes are very expensive, but larger in square feet. And so we, even when we had money, we still kept focusing on bringing down our expenses. So the point that I'm making is my monthly expenditures have not changed in the last 10 years, whereas my income has quadrupled. So you, you maintain that mentality over time, you will um, escalate. And so um, I would say just focus on you and don't compare yourself with these other people, right? Don't compare yeah. yourself with the Graham Stephens and stuff. I, I, I hate that they say, Oh, I make $30,000 a month from this, blah, that blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Really what it should be is um, what are sort of like the behaviors you're focusing on, but I understand that those don't get views, right? So yeah, it's the fancy stuff that gets the views. Uh, let me give a shout out. Shout out to Orlando Miner. He has a good channel. I like his channel a lot. Um, Gil has a question. You don't have to answer this if you want. I know for me personally, I don't really like going into the whole lifestyle stuff. But if you're well, if you want to share it, you're free to. He says, "Do you have any supercars?" Uh, okay. So I will say yes, but I will not disclose. And the reason why is because I don't want to be one of those people. And and, and like. This will sound really silly, but like I feel embarrassed talking about like money and wealth. The only reason why I even have um, that is because my very first car was so I don't know if you guys remember, but you guys would know the series Fast and the Furious. Well, what you guys may not realize is that the reason why they made the series Fast and the Furious was that people used to meet up at like coffee shops and then race cars. And they do that less now, but they used to take old Hondas like 1991 DX uh, civics and stuff. And they would race these things. And it became such a thing that Hollywood caught on and they made the movie fast and the furious. That's where fast and furious one came from. And I've always been like a gearhead. And, and my very first car was like a 1992 Honda Accord, and, and it was standard. And I loved it. And I'd drive that thing around. Like it was a race car. And anybody who would ask, I'd say, this is my Ferrari. And then, um, I just said one day I'm going to buy a Ferrari. And so, um, you know, I'm not saying that I, I have a Ferrari. In fact, I'll say that I don't have a Ferrari, but I would say that like, um, I, I ended up getting what I always dreamed about having when I was that 20 year old kid. And it was like a reward for all of the grind and, and all of the hard work. And, um, you know, there was a lot of nights where, you know, you, you, you can't even go home because you, you worked 18 hours and you got to go to a hotel downtown to sleep and then go back into work the next day. And so it's just a reward for all of that. Nice. And would you say that most of your success, because this is what I personally preach, I personally say that the best thing you could do, even more so than investing, of course, investing is important for the long term. But for my people who say I want to be rich now, I always say you got to figure out a way to increase your income. And so I would ask, like, is the reason you were able to get some of those nice things? Was it because you were able to, as you said, quadruple your income? Well, here's the answer to that. And I'll answer yeah. with a question. How can you save if you're not bringing in, right? There was a uh, you know, I'm, I'm a, I'm a Canadian. Right. And you know, one of the things we say is you, fo you don't just focus on defense. You also focus on offense, right? You're, you're, you can save as much money as you want, but if you're not bringing in a lot, it's just going to take a lot longer. And while you're saying, like, I would say 95% of the population should just be investing in index funds. Anyways, my channel is really geared towards that 5%, uh, who has excess cash to invest on their own. Um, those types of people that are in that 5%, they focused on their careers and like, what's stopping you from focusing on your career, right? Like, um, you know, Elon Musk said it, uh, the best. And I know there might not be like, I know some people might not like Elon Musk on this channel or people that are viewing, but he made a very good point. He's like, if you want to make a lot of money, focus on the areas that provide the most value and there's demand and supply imbalances. Like I would say teachers in Ontario provide a substantial amount of value, but the demand and supply imbalance makes it such that they don't make a lot of money or a substantial amount of money relative to like what I do. And I would say I provide less value to society than what a teacher does, but I'm making five, six times what they make. And it's because of demand supply. Not a lot of people want to put their nose in an Excel spreadsheet, you know, 12 hours a day or whatever. Right. And so, yeah, you're right. um, 
what are those opportunities? And, you know, one area where my brain just doesn't work, but I talk to these guys all the time because I'm in tech is those developers. They make, you know, 400 grand easy. And you'll never hear about, you'll never hear about these people. Right. And they work, work remotely. A lot of them moved into like, they moved out of California and New York, like Manhattan stuff there. They moved to like Pittsburgh or Ohio or, you know, Toledo in Ohio or like Ann Arbor or something or Florida. And so they have these homes that cost them 200 grand and they're making 400 every year. Who do you think the next billionaires are going to be? It's going to be these guys, right? Yeah. So yes. Um, I think you're absolutely right that if you are not focusing on your offense, you're missing out on 50% of the equation. And the one thing that I do recommend to people is like, look, you might not want these high paying jobs. You might not want it. You might love doing what you love doing. I've met a lot of people who love doing what they're doing. I bought a pizza bag a year ago, a pizza bag. And I did 250 deliveries on Uber Eats. And I talked about it on my channel. There's a four part series on it. And I talked about how you can make $20 an hour. That's not a lot of money, but you work three days a week, six days. uh, Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Three hours a day, six hours, six days a week. And you can make enough money to make a million dollars in like two years or something. Just like not, maybe not two years, maybe like five years. I'm just like throwing numbers out, but like effectively it's all disposable income that you can put into your portfolio. So if I loved what I did and it was low paying, I'd probably be doing Uber eats maybe at least three or four days a week just to make enough money to invest in the portfolio. You have to grind sometimes in order for me to get into a big four. I had to wake up at four in the morning. Cause I didn't come from a target school. I was a dummy in high school. Um, cause I was singularly focused on business and I didn't understand all the other stuff. Like talk to me about physics. I'll, I'll bore you because I know nothing, but, um, I would like, if I, if I didn't make a lot of money, that's kind of like what I would be doing. I would be focusing on, um, that kind of stuff. And sorry, what I meant to say was, uh, in order to get on with a big four, because they go to target schools, I actually audited newspaper routes at four in the morning. Uh, every morning just to just say that I had some audit experience. And that's how I got in with a big four because in Toronto, the competition at the time was very tough. Uh, you wouldn't get in unless you went to the Ivy league schools, like the Westerns or the Queens or uh, universe, uh Schulich university or whatever. You wouldn't get in going where I went. Interesting. Nice. So grind, there's nothing wrong with grinding, <laughs> right? Yeah, absolutely. So trading with a dummy says good episode. We'll follow more money. Yeah, everybody follow more money, please. Uh, thank you for the five dollar donation. And uh, yeah, everybody follow more money. And uh, yeah, anything else you want to ask? Um, yeah, you know what? I got a question for you. So um, you don't really talk about your investments a lot, but um, I'd be interested to know, like what percentage of your portfolio is dedicated to individual stocks? Yeah, for sure. So it used to be a lot more, uh, but at this point, I guess for the last year, or two, maybe two, uh, it's mostly just the S P five hundred. I, yeah, I personally, yeah. I personally really believe, and I like what you said. What you said, you hit the nail on the head, and I think so many more people in finance need to understand this. So what you said was, my channel is geared for the five percent of people who have the money and the time to invest in individual stocks, which is really what you're going to need. I personally don't have the time. Uh, I wouldn't even consider myself a sophisticated enough investor uh, where I should be picking individual stocks because it's a lot of hard work, like you said. And so, yeah, for me, most of my money's in the SP 500. Now, I do do individual stocks because, I mean, you know, some people just like to gamble a little bit. And I do. Not all my money, but some of yeah. it I do. So I do some individual stocks. But my theory is proven right because if you look at, because I have several portfolios, right? You look at my portfolios, which are mostly my retirement accounts that have the SP 500. They are destroying my other accounts, which, oh, yeah. Yeah. which has like, a, I think I have one portfolio that's like up 5%, but I also started it in like, you know, the bit, basically the bottom of the market, like pure luck. Like, yeah, I yeah. forgot when it was, but whenever the market hit like 3,600, I started buying individual stock, whatever, pure luck doesn't make me a genius. But the bottom line is most of my stocks, most of my individual portfolios with individual stocks. Like, for example, I'm down on Disney. I'm down on Amazon. Like most of my individual stocks I'm getting destroyed in S&P 500. I'm only down like what? 20%. I'm not down that bad. Like I'm really not. So it just, yeah, for me, uh, that's my investing style. And that's why, because I used to do uh, individual stocks. I used to talk about it. I used to talk about the market. And then I'm just like, 
this doesn't make any sense. I don't even do this stuff. So why am I doing this? I yeah. just tried the SP. So I'm like, it's, it's just, so that's why I stopped. But yeah. Yeah. Don't, don't be problem. anything that you're not because you'll get, yeah, exactly. Like, it, it'll, it'll show. And you know, yep. like I, I used to tell people early on in the Patreon, like what I was investing in. And then, um, uh, I got very scared because I had a call with one of my friends and I'm like, what do you, what do you have in your portfolio? And he just listed every stock that was in like my, in my portfolio. I'm like, Ooh, okay. I'm not telling you guys what I'm invested in ever again. Cause you guys are just copying me. Um, and, uh, you know, my, my, like what I tend to focus on is I do have a Patreon and for five bucks, you can see all my models. And the whole point is that I say there's four questions and we can just end it at this. There's four questions that I ask uh, people to ask when they're investing in a security. And, and those four questions are, you know, like, do you understand the business? Um, do you feel that the business has sustainable long-term economic characteristics? Does the management operate on behalf of the shareholders? Mm -hmm. And is it selling for a reasonable price to its intrinsic value? And that last part is why I have the Patreon. Cause I, I, I model out the company based on the first three questions and really it's just showing people how I'm modeling it. And then they will send me their models and say, Hey, look, this is what I'm seeing. What do you think? And I'm like, I love that because it's moving the conversation away from story more to like, let's turn that story into um, numbers. And I think that investing is a bit of an art and a science. And so the science is the modeling and the art is like, how we sort of see the picture transpiring into the numbers. Because when you start looking at the numbers, you can really tell if you're lying to yourself. And the one example I gave is I didn't want to talk a lot of smack on stocks that I thought were expensive during the last year, but I did make one video on one stock, which was Open Door, I think it was. Okay. And I said that that stock was worth th between 3 and $6 and it was trading at $30 at the time. And um, I didn't know how YouTube would respond to that. And so I stopped doing it. I, I could have talked about more. I could have talked about Shopify, all these guys, but I just did it on the one. And um, you know, I think it's trading at $2 today, to today. But there was a situation where I actually believed in the product. I, I, I do believe that there is a portion of the market that will be served by the iBuying market. Not the whole market, but maybe like 2% of sellers will be served by iBuying. So let's model that out and see what that says. And it says that the stock's worth three to six bucks, but people are paying 30 for it. So you can see how people got burned, even though it was a relatively okay story, you know? So. Yeah. How do you feel about the, uh, how do you feel about the grifter slaying space? How do you feel about channels like myself, Strongman, Scott Schaefer? How do you feel about that whole thing that has really risen uh, this year during the bear uh, market? It's really come to so prominence. Just from being a stand-up comic, uh, or at least I used to be, I don't do it anymore. Um, one of the things about stand-up comedy is it's important in society because you call out things that are wrong, right? And and you can see, like one of my friends, um, I guess he's an acquaintance, not necessarily a friend. We we only talked at shows. His name's Ryan Long. And you can like YouTube Ryan Long and he got very popular, especially in like the anti-woke space. Um, but he got popular because he's telling a truth right? There, there's a truth in like over becoming overly politically correct, right? There's nothing wrong with being politically correct, but once you overcorrect, there becomes an issue. And that's where I think a lot of um, like liberal type people have an issue with like excessive wokeness type stuff. With YouTube, there's an issue with people overrepresenting themselves. And what you need is a correcting mechanism. So when I found about found out about strongman finance, I reached out to him immediately and I said, you know, let's chat because strongman finance yourself and all of the people who like call out the people who mischaracterize themselves. What you guys are doing is you are a natural force to something that went out of balance. Right. And so sure. notice I've only done two live streams and the only two live streams that I've done is with the people that are calling this stuff out. You guys are important. My wife, saw a strong a video strongman and she's like why are you going on with this guy he doesn't even wear a shirt i'm like pay attention to what he says not what he looks like i'd rather yeah. go on a live stream with a shirtless truth teller than a suited up liar and so that's my thoughts on this space i think you guys are absolutely necessary to call out or delineate 
the uh, people that actually know what they're talking about from the people that are misrepresenting themselves. And I think it's very important and I think um, it's going to grow. So I, I, you know, this time next year, you're probably going to have 50,000 subs. I'll have 12,000. And so I'll just be like, you know, I was, I was on his journey. And so it's, it's nice to see him, him be successful. That's interesting. I appreciate that. Yeah. The channels, eh, hopefully it grows more. We'll see, but yeah, I just wanted to get your opinion. Cause I think that, uh, I do, I agree with you. I do think that what we're doing is extremely important, but as somebody like you, who I feel is just very reasonable in your, your analysis, you're not biased at all. Just want to get your opinion because I get so many people who are like, oh, you do is drama and you just crap on people and you're just a hater and all that. So that's why I want to hear your opinion. Yeah, no, you know what? I like it. And and uh, I was telling you this earlier that your channel actually comes up on my YouTube feed. Like if I were just to click into YouTube right now, um, the yeah, the first video is you four months ago. And so like, wow. uh, oh, and Strongman, something about nuked to oblivion. Oh, he just released that video. That's why. But like, yeah, <laughs> your guys' channels come up. And, and the reason, um, uh, uh, like what I said, the value that you guys are providing, and, and I would say this off of this channel as well, and I've said it to my wife uh, privately, is that... Um, the value that you guys are providing is you guys, once again, I'm repeating myself, you are a balancing mechanism to a space full of liars. Yeah. And so that is the value. If people don't see the value, then they're looking in the wrong place. If you're looking for someone to tell you what they feel a stock is worth, go to more money. If you're looking for someone to call out a grift and do the research, like for example, uh, the disclosure of the losses on Tesla by meet Kevin and all that work that you did, that's incredibly valuable. And you can't, um, with the last time I looked at that video, I think it got 2,500 views or something. You can't disregard the fact that there's 2,500 individual people that watch that video. That doesn't oh. mean it's a non-value. You see what I'm saying? Oh, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, value. it's a 6,000. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a 6,000. Oh, 6, look now. at how much it's grown. So, yeah, it did, it did pretty well, yep. So like- Think about the last time you saw 6,000 people in real life. Now, the biggest crowd that I've ever performed in front of was um, 500 people. That felt like a stadium, right? So imagine 6,000 people is who are watching your your video. So like, that's crazy. So um, disregard any of the haters in the comments because um, they're going to try to tell you how to make your content. I lost a one subscriber for sure who said, I'm very sad that you did a live stream with Strongman Finance. And my comment to that was, well, watch me because I'm going to do it again. And so I reached out to you and I'll continue doing whatever the hell I want to do because I feel that it's the right thing to do. And so, um, yeah, I'm happy to chat with you guys. If you guys don't get too big, I'd love to come back on your channels one day. <laughs> Um, if you want to help us bottom feeders here, but <laughs> <laughs> well, well, how do you, how do you think this ends? Because, or do you think it'll end at all? Because, you know, obviously there are some channels like Chris Sane and others whose channels have died, but then you have other channels like me, Kevin, uh, Jeremy, people like that, whose channels are stronger than ever. You could actually argue that they're probably getting more views <laughs> this year than they got last year, which is crazy. Um, but the, 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 you're not going to like the answer. I've been around a long time. And um, what will happen is um, people go in and out. So um, the, the, the miss, the, the, like the space of people telling you what you want to hear, creating an echo chamber behind a particular security, like for example, Palantir, which was a, a huge echo chamber for a long time. Um, that will continue and it'll continue in different ways. So for example, in Canada, there used to be a company called BlackBerry and um, that stock was super, super popular. And if you said anything about BlackBerry uh, negative, people would actually genu genuinely get mad at you. And um, the comment I used to make to everyone is how, like what will BlackBerry's number one and two product be 25 years from now? And if you can't answer that, then you probably shouldn't be investing in the company. You don't know the industry well enough. Um, Philip Correa, is it Philip Correa? I can't remember. It might be Philip Correa, but there was an old time investor. He wrote the book called Common Stocks, Uncommon Profits. So guys, look it up. In that book, he talked, and this was written in the 50s. He understood Samsung well enough to say in the 50s that eventually the 
technology will go to the point where you can hang TVs on the wall like photos, like like pictures. He understood that industry that well that he could invest in Samsung. I could not. So I, I obviously can't invest in Samsung. So um um there's gonna be there's gonna be people that understand industries, but there's also gonna be people who don't and they're gonna create echo chambers and there's gonna be more and more channels that come up. And the thing about the world today is that there aren't 22 channels on TV anymore, right? There's millions of YouTube channels and there's just gonna be millions of echo chambers created, not just on YouTube, but also on Seeking Alpha, on Quora. You're the only one who's ever mentioned Quora, but that's another place where echo chambers get created. Pinterest, Instagram, et cetera. It's only gonna get worse. But every time it happens, People get burned because the only thing that works is the four questions that I mentioned, because the four questions are broad on purpose because you never know what the issue is in the future. Some things may look similar, but they may not be like, who would have predicted 10 years ago that Bitcoin would be a thing, right? Yeah. We all see value in crypto, but there was a lot of excesses that have happened as well in crypto. And a lot of people lost money um, because of it. And so, where that ends, who knows, right? Even Warren Buffett even said, listen, I don't really want to talk about this, but if you're going to have my take on it, it's like, you know, not something that we'll ever invest in, you know? And so unfortunately, um, this continues, but that means that for channels like you, you have an unlimited supply of grifters to call out. So um, it is a, so if I were to long-term bull on a particular channel, it'd be yours and strongman finance because there's a never ending supply of this garbage that needs to be uh, shown the light of. Yeah, absolutely. Nice. All right. Do we got anything else that we want to talk about or is that it? Um, I think that might be it. We've gone for an hour and you know what? I, I have some questions for you, but like, I'll leave it for the next time we get together. Cause I think this was fun. Um, and we'll leave it there if that's okay with you. Okay. Yeah. That sounds good. All right, man. All right. Well, everybody subscribe to more money. Definitely appreciate you being here. Definitely appreciate your perspective. Your breakdown of me, Kevin's jet was awesome. The whole jet thing, the grifter space, building up wealth and stuff like that was all great. So definitely appreciate you. And by the way, I don't think I've said this, but I do watch your channel. And oh, do you? uh, yeah, I, I do watch your channel and I do enjoy it. I'm like, wow, this guy is very, very knowledgeable. So I, <laughs> I, I enjoy learning a lot from you. So it's awesome. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And I, I just try my best and you know, I'm going to get things wrong, but that's okay. That's part of the journey. Nice. All right. Well, I guess that's it. Oh, thank you for the $5 donation. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. All right, I'm going to go ahead and end the broadcast then. Thanks, okay. everybody, for being here. All right, see ya. Bye now.